sing of an English king. Bedford, tis true we are in great danger. The greater therefore should our courage be. Good morrow, old Sir Thomas Erpingham. A good soft pillow for that good white head were better than a churlish strip of France. Not so, my liege. This lodging likes me better, since I may say, now lie I like a king. Let me thy cloak, Sir Thomas. Brothers both, commit me to the princes in our camp. Do my good morrow to them, and anon desire them into my pavilion. We shall, my liege. Shall I attend your grace? No, my good knight. I and my bosom must debate a while, and then I have no other company. The Lord in heaven bless thee, noble Herod. We have a friend. Discuss unto me. Art thou officer, or art thou base, common, and popular? I am a gentleman of a company. What are you? As good a gentleman as the emperor. Then you are a better than the king. The king's a baka, a heart of gold, a lad of life and a fist most valiant. I kiss his dirty shoe, and from heart string, I love the lovely bully. What is thy name? Harry the Roy. The Roy. <laughs> Cornish name. <laughs> no, I am a Welshman. Knowest thou Fluellen? Yes. Tell him I'll knock his leaf about his hate come St. David's Day. Do not you wear your dagger in your cap that day, lest he knock that about yours. Art thou his friend? And his kinsman too. The big oath be then. I thank you. God be with you. The name's Pistol Call. It sorts well with your fierceness. <laughs> Captain Fluellen! No! In the name of our Lord, speak lower. If you would but take the pains to examine the wars of Pompey the Great, you shall find, I warrant you, that there is no tittle-tattle nor fibble babble in Pompey's camp. Why? The enemy is loud. You hear him all night. <laughs> <laughs> if the enemy is a mule and a fool and a prating coxcomb, it is meet, thank you, that we should also look you be a mule and a fool and a prating coxcomb in your own conscience now. I will speak lower. Pray we beseech you that you will. Though it appear a little out of fashion, there is much care and valor in this Welshman. Brother John Bates, mm. is not that the morning which breaks yonder? I believe it is. But we have no great cause to desire the approach of day. We see yonder the beginning of day, but I think we shall never see the end of it. Who goes there? A friend. Under what captain serve you? Under Sir Thomas Erpingham. A good old commander and a most kind gentleman. I pray you, what thinks he of our estate? Even his men wrecked upon a sand that took to be washed off the next tide. He hath not told his fault to the king? No, nor does not mean he should. I think the king is but a man, as I am. <laughs> the violet smells to him as it doth to me. His ceremony's laid by, and his nakedness he appears but a man. Therefore, when he sees reason of fears, uh, as we do, his fears out of doubt be of the same relish as ours are. Yet in reason no man should possess him with any appearance of fear, lest he by showing it should dishearten his army. He may show what however courage he will, but I believe as cold a night as tis, he could wish himself in Tim's up to the neck. <laughs> and so I would he were, and I by him, all adventure so he were quit here. I think he would not wish himself anywhere but where he is. So I would he were here alone, so should he be sure to be ransomed and many a poor man's life saved. Methinks I could not die anywhere so contented as in the king's company, his cause being just and his quarrel honorable. That's more than we know. Aye, more than we should seek after, for we know enough. If we know we are the king's subjects, if his cause be wrong, our obedience to the king wipes the crime of it out of us. But if the cause be not good, the king himself hath a heavy reckoning to make when all those legs and arms and heads chopped off in battle shall rise at the latter day and cry all, we died at such a place. Some swearing, some crying for a surgeon, some upon their wives left poor behind, some upon the debts they owe, some upon their children for all he left. I'm feared there are few die well that die in battle. 
For how can they charitably dispose of anything when blood is in their argument? Now, if these men do not die well, it will be a black matter for the cane that led them there. So, if a son that is by his father set about merchandise do sinfully miscarry upon the sea, the imputations of his wickedness by your rule should be imposed upon his father that sent him. But this is not so. The king is not bound to answer the particular endings of his soldiers, for they purpose not their death when they purpose their services. Besides, there's no king, be his cause never so spotless, can try it out with all the spotted soldiers. Every subject's duty is the king's, but every subject's soul is his own. Tis certain. Every man that dies ill, the ill upon his own head. The king is not to answer for it. But I do not desire he should answer for me, yet I determine to fight lustily for him. I myself heard the king say he would not be ransomed. I said so to make us fight cheerfully. But when our throats are cut, he may be ransomed and we ne'er the wiser. If ever I live to see it, I will never trust his word after. You pay him then. You'll never trust his word after. Your reproof is something too round. I should be angry with you if the time were convenient. Let it be a quarrel between us if you live. I embrace it. How shall I know thee again? Give me any gauge of thine and I will wear it in my bonnet. Then if ever thou darest acknowledge it, I will make it my quarrel. Here is my glove. Give me another of thine. There. This will I also wear in my cap. If thou ever comes to me and say, after tomorrow, this is my glove, by this hand I will take thee a box of the ear. If ever I live to see it, I will challenge it. Be friends, you English fools, be friends. <laughs> we have French pearls enough. <laughs> 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 On the king, but it's our lives, our souls, our debts, our careful wives, our children and our sins lay on the king. We must bear all. So hard condition, twin born with greatness, subject to the breath of every fool. But infinite heart's ease must kings neglect that private men enjoy. Of kings that privates have not to, save ceremony, save general ceremony. Ceremony, show me but thy worth. Art thou aught else but place to greet and form, creating awe and fear in other men? I am a king that find thee, and I know tis not the balm, the scepter in the ball, the throne he sits on, nor the tide of pomp that beats upon the high shore of this world. No. Not all these thrice gorgeous ceremony, not all these. My lord, your nobles, jealous of your absence, seek through your camp to find you. Good old knight, collect them together in my tent. I'll be before thee. I shall do it, my lord. O oh God of battles, Steal my soldiers' hearts. Possess them not with fear. Take from them now the sense of reckoning of the opposed numbers. Pluck their hearts from them. Oh, not today, O oh Lord, oh, not today. Think not upon the fault my father made encompassing the crown. My liege, my brother really Gloucester's voice. Hi, I know thy errand. I will go with thee. The day, my friends, and all things stay for me. Let the trumpets sound, 
for our approach shall so much share the field that the English shall couch down in fear and yield. They have said their prayers, and they have stayed for death. On to the field! Come, come away! The sun is high, and we outwear the day. Where's the king? The king himself hath thrown to be the battle. The fighting men, they have full three score thousand. There's five to one. Besides, they all are fresh. Gods of them strike with us to some fearful odds. Oh, that we now have here but one ten thousand of those men in England that do no work today. What's he that wishes so? My cousin, Westmoreland. No, my fair cousin, if we are marked to die, we are enough to do our country loss. And if to live, the fewer men, the greater share of honor. God's will, I pray thee, wish not one man more. Rather, proclaim at Westmoreland through my host that he which hath no stomach to this fight, let him depart. His passport shall be made, and crowns for convoy put in his purse. We would not die in that man's company that fears his fellowship to die with us. This day, is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when the day is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He that shall live this day and see old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbors and say, tomorrow is Saint Crispian. Then will he strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, these wounds I had on Crispian's day. Old men forget you, all should be forgot, but he will remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Then shall our names, familiar in his mouth as household words, Harry the King, Bedford, and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester, be in their flowing cups, freshly remember this story, shall the good man teach his son, and Crispin, Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day till the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother, be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England now of bed shall think themselves accursed that they were not here and hold their manhoods cheap whilst any speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin's Day. My sovereign lord, show yourself with speed. Friends are bravely in the battle set and will with all expedience charge on us. All things are ready if our minds be so. Perish the man whose mind is backward now. Thou dost not wish more help from England, cuz. God's will. My liege, would you and I alone without more help could fight this royal battle? Once more I come to know of thee, King Harry, and for thy ransom wilt thou now compound before thy most assured overthrow. Who has sent thee now? The Constable of France. I pray thee, bear my former answer back. Bid them achieve me and then sell my bones. Let me speak proudly. Tell the constable we are but warriors for the working day. Our gayness and our guilt are all besmirched with rainy marching in the painful fields, but by the mass our hearts are in the trim. Come thou no more for ransom, gentle herald. They shalt have none, I swear, but these my joints, which if they have, as I will leave of them, shall yield them little. Tell the constable. I shall, King Harry, and so fare thee well. Thou never shalt hear heralds any more. My lord, most humbly on my knee, I beg the leading of the bayward. Take it, brave York. Now, soldiers, march away. 
How thou pleasest, God. Dispose the day. I did never know so full a voice to issue from so empty a heart. If the saying is true, the empty vessel makes the greatest sound.
Mathon, yet keep the French the field. The Duke of York commends him to your majesty. Will you see him, uncle? Thrice within this hour I saw him down. Thrice up again in fighting, from helmet to spur, all blood he was. In which array, brave soldier, doth he lie? Larding the plain and by his bloody side, yoke fellow to his honor owing wounds. The noble Earl of Suffolk also lies. Suffolk first died, and York all haggled over, comes to him, where in gore he lay and steeped, and cries aloud, Terry, dear cousin Suffolk, my soul shall thine keep company to heaven. Terry, sweet soul, for mine, and fly abreast, as in this glorious and well fought field we kept together in our chivalry. Upon these words I came and cheered him up. He smiled me in the face, brought me his hand. The feeble gripe says, Dear my lord, commend my service to me sovereign. The pretty and sweet matter that forced those waters from me, which I would have stopped, but I had not so much of man in me. And all my mother came into mine eyes and gave me up to tears. Blame you not. For hearing this, I must perforce compound with missful eyes, or they will issue too. Hark! What new alarm is the same? The French have reinforced their scattered men. Let every soldier kill his prisoners. Give the word through. Kill the boys and the luggage. Tis expressly against the law of arms. Tis an arrogant piece of knavery. Mock you now, as can be offered in your conscience now, and it not. Tis certain there's not a boy left alive, and the cowardly rascals that have run from this battle have done this slaughter. I was not angry since I came to France until this instant. Take a trumpet now. Ride thou unto the horsemen on yon hill. If they will fight with us, bid them come down. Or void the fields, they do offend our sight. If they'll do neither, we'll come to them. Besides, we'll cut the throats of those we have. Not a man of them that we shall take shall taste our mercy. Go and tell them so. Here comes the herald of the French, my liege. What means this, herald? Comest thou again for ransom? No, great king. I come to thee for charitable license, that we may wander o'er this bloody field to look our dead and then to bury them, to sort our nobles from our common men. For many of our princes lie drowned and soaked in mercenary blood. Give us leave, great king, to view this field in safety and dispose of their dead bodies. I tell thee truly, Herod, I know not if the day be ours or no. The day is yours. Praise God. Not our strength for it. What is this castle called that stands hard by? They call it Agincourt. Then call we this. The field of Agincourt, fought on the day of Crispin Crispianus. Your grandfather of famous memory, and please your majesty, and your great uncle Edward, the Black Prince of Wales, as I have read in the Chronicles, fought the most brave battle here in France. They did, Blue Ellen. Ah, oh, your majesty says very true. If your majesty is remembered of the Welshmen did good service in a garden where leeks did grow, wearing leeks in their mouth caps, which <laughs> Your Majesty, no, to this hour is an honorable badge of the service, and I do believe Your Majesty takes no scorn to wear the leak upon St. Davy's Day. I wear it for a memorable honor, for I am Welsh, you know, good countrymen. By Jeshu, I am Your Majesty's countrymen. I care not who knows it, I will confess it to all the world. I need not be ashamed of Your Majesty. Praise be God. So long as your majesty is an honest man. God keep me so. Our heralds, go with him. Bring me just notice of the numbers dead on both our parts. Call yonder fellow hither. Soldier, you must come to the king. Soldier, why wearest thou that love in thy cap? And please, your majesty, tis the gauge of when I should fight with all if he be alive. An Englishman. And please, your majesty, a rascal has swaggered with me last night, who, if alive and ever dared to challenge his glove, I have sworn to take him a box of the ear. Or if I could see my glove in his cap, which he swore as he was a soldier he would wear, I will strike it out soundly. 
What think you, Captain Fluellen? Is it fit the soldier keep his oath? He is a craven and a villain, and please your majesty in my conscience. Then keep thy bow, Sierra, when thou meetest the fellow. So I will, my liege, as I live. Who service thou under? Under Captain Gower, my liege. Call it hither to me, soldier. I will, my liege. Here, Fluellen. Wear thou this favor for me and stick it in thy cap. If any man challenge it, he is an enemy to our person. And if thou encounter any such, apprehend him, and thou dost me love. Ah, oh, your grace does me as great honors as can be desired in the hearts of his subjects. Knowest thou Gower? He is my dear friend, and please you. Pray, go seek him and call him to my tent. How affection! <laughs> my lord, Salisbury, and my cousin Gloucester, follow Fluellen closely at the heels. The glove, which I have given him for a favor, may happily purchase him a box of the ear. <laughs> it's the soldiers. I, by bargain, should wear it myself. Follow, said Cousin Salisbury. If that the soldiers strike him, which as I judge by his blood bearing, he will keep his word, some sudden mischief may arise of it. For I do know Fluellen, valiant, touch with collar, on his gunpowder, and quickly will return an injury. Follow. You see, there be no harm between them. Go you with me, Uncle of Exeter. Sir, know you this glove? No, the glove. I know the glove is a glove. I know this. <laughs> How now? How now? What's the matter? How now? What's the matter? Yeah. My liege! Here is a villain and a traitor! Give me that glove, soldier. Look, here is the fellow of it. To what I indeed thou promised to strike, and thou hast given me most bitter terms. And please your majesty, let his neck answer for it if there is any martial law in the world. How canst thou make me satisfaction? All offenses, my lord, come from the heart. Never any came from mine that would offend your majesty. <laughs> it was ourself thou didst abuse. Your majesty came out like yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and what you suffered under that shape, I beseech you take it for your own fault, not for mine. For had you been what I took you for, I made no offense. Therefore, I beseech your highness. Pardon me. Here, Uncle Exeter. Fill this glove with crowns and give it to the fellow. Wear it, fellow. Keep it for an hour in my cap till I do challenge it. Give him the crowns. And Captain, you must needs be friends with him. By this day and this light, the fellow has metal enough in his belly. Hold. There's twelve pence for you. And I pray you to serve God and keep you out of brawls and brabbles and quarrels and dissensions, and I warrant you it is the better for you. Now, Harold, I a dead number. Here is the number of the slaughtered French. This note does tell me of 10,000 French that in the field lie slain. Of princes in this number, and nobles bearing banners, there lies dead. 126, added to these of knights, esquires, and gallant gentlemen, 8,400, 500 of which were but yesterday dubbed knights. Here was a royal fellowship of death. Where's the number of our English dead? Edward, Duke of York, Earl of Suffolk, Sir Richard Ketley, they began as squire. None else of name, and of all other men but five and twenty. Tis wonderful. Come, go we in procession to the village, and be a death proclaimed throughout our host to boast of this or take the praise of God, which is his only. Oh, but is it not lawful? And please, Your Majesty, to tell how many is killed. Yes, Captain. But with this acknowledgement that God, for us. Yes, my conscience, he did us great good. Do we all holy rites? Let there be sung non nobis and te deum, the dead with charity enclosed in clay, and then to clay. 
and to England then, when there from France arrived more happy men. Non hobis domine, domine. Non hobis domine. Sed domine, sed domine. Nuda gloria. Royalty, 
by whom this great assembly is contrived, we do salute you, Duke of Burgundy. Bright joyous are we to behold your face, most worthy brother England, fairly met. So are you, Prince English, every one. So happy be the issue, brother England, of this good day and of this gracious meeting, as we are now glad to behold your eyes. Your eyes, which hitherto have borne in them against the French the fatal balls of murdering basilisks. The venom of such looks we fairly hope have lost their quality, and that this day shall change all griefs and quarrels into love. To cry amen to that, thus we appear. My duty to you both on equal love, great kings of France and England. Since then, my office hath so far prevailed that face to face and royal eye to eye you have been greeted. Let it not disgrace me if I demand before this royal view why that the naked, poor, and mangled peace should not in this best garden of the world, our fertile France, put up her lovely visage. Alas, she hath from France too long been chased, and all her husbandry doth lie on heaps, corrupting in its own fertility. Even as our vineyards, fallows, meads, and hedges, defective in their natures, grow to wildness, even so, our houses and ourselves and children have lost. Oh, do not learn for want of time the sciences that should become our country, but grow like savages, like soldiers will that nothing do but meditate on blood, to swearing and stern looks, diffused attire, and everything that seems unnatural. And my speech entreats that I may know the let, why gentle peace should not expel these inconveniences and bless us with her former qualities. If, Duke of Burgundy, you would the peace, whose want gives growth to the imperfections which you have cited, you must buy that peace with full accord to all our just demands. I have but with a cursory eye, for glance the articles pleaseth your grace, to appoint some of your council presently to sit with us once more. We will suddenly pass our accept and peremptory answer. Brother, we shall. Will you, fair sister, go with the princes, or stay here with us? Our gracious brother, I will go with them. Happily, woman's voice may do some good when articles too nicely urged we stood on. Oh, yet leave our cousin Catherine here with us. She is our capital demand, comprised within the four ranks of our articles. She hath good leave. Fair Catherine, and most fair, will you vouchsafe to teach a soldier turn such as will enter at a lady's ear to plead his love suit to her gentle heart? Your majesty shall knock at me. I cannot speak your England. Most fair Catherine, if you will let, tell me how you love me with your French heart, I shall be glad to hear you confess it brokenly with your English tongue. Do you like me, Kate? Pardon moi, I cannot tell what is like me. An angel is like you, Kate. And you are like an angel. <laughs> oh, mon Dieu. The langue des hommes sont pleines de tromperies. What says she, fair one? That, that the tongues of men are full of deceits? Oui, that is the process. <laughs> In faith, Kate, my wooing is fit for thy understanding. I am glad thou canst speak no better English, for if thou couldst, thou wouldst find me such a plain king that thou wouldst think I'd sold my farm to buy my crown. I know no ways to mince it in love, but directly to say I love you. Give me your answer, Faith, do. And so clap hands in a bargain. How say you, lady? So votre honneur, me understand well. Mary, you would put me to verses, or to dance for your sake, Kate, why you undid me. If I could win a lady at leapfrog, or by vaulting into my saddle with my armor on my back, I should quickly leap into a wife. <laughs> oh, but before God, Kate, I cannot look free in me, nor gasp out my eloquence, nor I have no cunning in protestation, only downright oaths, which I never use to urge, nor never break for urging. Thou canst love a fellow of this temper, Kate, that never looks in his glass for love of anything he sees there. Let thine eye be thy cook. I speak to thee, plain soldier. If thou canst love me for this, take me. If not, to say to thee that I shall die is true. But for thy love, by the Lord, no. Yet I love thee too. 
But thou hast such a one, take me. And take me, take a soldier. Well, take a soldier, take a king. And what sayest thou then to my love? Speak, my fair and fairly, I, I pray thee. Is it possible that I should love the enemy of France? No, it is not possible that you should love the enemy of France, Kate. But in loving me, you should love the friend of France. For I love France so well that I will not part with the village of it. I shall have it all mine. And, Kate, when France is mine and I am yours, then yours is France and you are mine. I cannot tell what is that. <laughs> no, Kate? I will tell thee in French, which I am sure will hang upon my tongue like a new married wife about her husband's neck, hardly to be shook off. <laughs> Je compte sur la procession de France, et quand vous avez la procession de moi, uh, let me see, what then? Donc votre est France, et vous êtes mienne. <laughs> It is as easy for me, Kate, to conquer the kingdom as to speak so much more French. I shall never move thee in French unless it be to laugh at me. So, votre honneur, le français que tu parles est meilleur que l'anglais lequel je parle. No, Faith, it's not. But, Kate, dost thou understand thus much English? Canst thou love me? I do not know that. No. It is hereafter to know, but, but now to promise. By mine honor and true English, I love thee, Kate, by which honor I dare not swear that thou lovest me, yet my blood begins to flatter me that thou dost, notwithstanding the poor and intemperate effect of my visage. Oh, now beshrew my father's ambition. He was thinking of civil wars when he got me, and therefore was I treated with a stubborn outside that when I come to woo ladies, I fright them. <laughs> <laughs> but in faith, Kate, the elder I wax, the better I shall appear. <laughs> my comfort is that Old age, that ill layer up of beauty, can do no more spoil upon my face. Oh, thou hast me, if thou hast me at the worst, and thou shalt wear me, if thou wear me better and better. And therefore tell me, most fair Catherine, will you have me? Put off your maiden blushes, about the thoughts of your heart with the looks of an empress. Take me by the hand, and say, Harry of England, I am thine. That is as it should please you, mon roi, mon père. Nay, it shall please him well, Kate. It shall please him, Kate. Then it shall also content me. Upon that, I kiss your hand, and I call you my queen. Monsieur, 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 Monsieur,
Now welcome, Kate, and bear me witness all that here I kiss her as my sovereign queen. God, the best maker of all marriages, combine your hearts in one, your realms in one. As man and wife, being two, are one in love, so be there twixt your kingdom such a spousal that never made ill office or fell jealousy, which troubles off the bed of blessed marriage, thrust in between the fraction of these kingdoms to make divorce of their corporate league, that English may, as French, French Englishmen receive each other. God speak this, amen. 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 Prepare we for our marriage. On which day, my lord of Burgundy, will take your oath, and all the peers for surety of their leagues. Then shall I swear to Kate, and you to me, and may our oaths well kept and prosperous be. Thus far with rough and all unable pen, our bending author hath pursued the story. In little room confining mighty men. Mangling by starts the full course of their glory. Small time, but in this small most greatly lived, this star of England. Fortune made his sword, by which the world's best garden be achieved, and of it left his son, imperial lord. Henry the Sixth, in infant bands, crowned king of France and England, did this king succeed. The state of which so many had the managing, that they lost France and made his England bleed. Which oft our stage hath shown, and for their sake, in your fair minds let this acceptance take. 